bacterial pathogenesis so first i would like to emphasize three terms the first one is pathogenesis pathogenesis is the origin and development of disease virulence next word is virulence virulence is the capability of a microorganism to cause disease the next one is virulent factor the molecule expressed and secreted by pathogens that help in pathogenesis these virulent factors <coughs> are present on the bacteria and they are secreted by the bacteria whenever an organism has a potent virulent factors and that organism we can call it as more virulent organism which can cause a severe infection so pathogenesis is the process of causing infection whenever the organism enters into the human body and how it causes the infection is nothing but the pathogenesis so majority of bacteria are non pathogenic in nature because of wide vaccination antibiotics and because of public health care measures and because of potent immune system of the humans host defense mechanism potent immune mechanisms so because of all these uh, factors most of the pathogens they can't cause infection most of the bacteria they can't cause infections only 10% of organisms are pathogenic in nature and that pathogenicity depends mainly upon the characteristic of bacteria and its virulence nature the factors that are present the virulent factors that are present on the bacteria's strains and the status of the immune system of the host and the exposure of human body to number of organisms the number of organisms exposure to the human body so normal flora normal flora is the bacteria which is which are found in or on our bodies on a semi permanent basis without causing disease the bacteria which are present on the human bodies without causing infection we can call those bacteria as normal flora we can have normal flora in gi tract we can have normal flora on skin we can have normal flora on urinary tract so we can have a lot of bacteria in and on human beings so some important ones which are present in gi tract are bacteroids they are normally seen in gi tract which won't cause any infection until unless there is a break in the skin if the bacteria are pushed deep into the inoculated deep into the gi tract tissues then only you can start to see the infection by bacteria otherwise they are normally seen in the gi tract on the gi tract epithelium and the other organism in gi tract normally seen as enterobacteriaceae this enterobacteriaceae group of organisms <coughs> they are always seen inside the gi tract those are e coli shigella yersinia salmonella you can see this group of organisms inside the gi tract and they won't cause any infection they are normal flora of gi tract and on the skin the normal flora that are seen on the skin as staphylococcus that is staphylococcus aureus staphylococcus epidermidis and propinobacterium these organisms they never cause any infection until unless there is a break in the skin if there is a break in the skin because of trauma or because of injury these organisms can be in can be inoculated into the tissues deeper tissues then you can start to see the skin infection or severe infection whenever they enters into the blood stream there you can see severe infections normally they won't cause any infection in immune competent individuals humans only get this infection whenever this normal back normal flora bacteria enters into the tissues and in that human being if the immune system is weak then definitely you can see the infection in that individuals and the next important thing is nosocomial nosocomial this nosocomial always refers to nosocomial infections that is hospitally acquired infections if at all a patient join in a hospital with some problem and if he gets an infection by a bacteria which normally seen in hospital environments we can call it as nosocomial infection where the patient got the infection from the hospitals so those are called as nosocomial infections most of the nosocomial bacteria are antibiotic resistant in nature they'll have high resistance very hard to treat so the transmission of bacteria how the bacteria will get transmitted by airborne route through respiratory route we can inhale this airborne droplets and we can get infections by food the contaminated food can also help in transmitting this bacteria 
by water contaminated water by sexual contact like gonococcal infection or chlamydial infections we can get vectors by insects by mosquitoes we can get a lot of infections by ticks we can get a lot of infections like uh, rocky mountain spotted fever next is addition how the bacteria will attach to the tissues host tissues so it requires two things that is one is bacterial adhesions and other one is host cell receptors specific host cell receptors so some few bacterial adhesions that help in attaching the bacteria to the host cells are pili slime layer capsule lipotactic acids and endotoxins can help in attaching the bacteria to the host cells whenever they have this adhesions they must also have a specific receptors on the host cell surface those host cell surface receptors normally give addition help in addition as fibronectin mannose receptors silic acid receptors and glycoproteins which are present on the host cells they will always help in attaching to this bacterial addition so the bacteria will come and attach to the host cells so after attachment what happens they will spread so we will see first the addition here is the picture that can explain about the addition of bacteria to the host cell epithelium here this is the epithelium of the host cell and these are the receptors present on the host epithelial cells this black colored dots and here the pink colored circular ones are bacteria and these bacteria has adhesions like pili or glycoproteins whenever these glycoproteins attaches to the specific receptors on the epithelial cell and the bacteria will also go and attaches to this epithelium so then they can cause infection either staying on the surface of back epithelial cells of the host or by entering into the epithelial cells or by entering into the epithelial cells and bloodstream they can cause infection so after infection what can happen the penetration and spread of this organism into the human tissues how this penetration occurs this penetration and spread can occur in three ways some bacteria they always like to stay extracellular pathogens as extracellular pathogens some bacteria like vibrio cholera here in the first picture this is the epithelium and this is the blood vessel so in this first uh, picture we'll explain i'll try i'll try to explain about extracellular pathogens which are which will stay outside of the cell and cause the distraction so here is the bacteria that enters into the human tissue human humans and they are attaching to the epithelium of the human tissues but these bacteria which are extracellular they won't enter into the cells they won't they are not invasive in nature they will always stay on the surface of epithelial cell and they secrete these molecules and exotoxins and they will damage these cells by staying outside of the cell so we can call these bacteria as extracellular pathogens the best example is vibrio cholera vibrio cholera always attaches to the human gi tract epithelium and releases a cholera toxin and that cholera toxin stimulates this epithelial cell to secrete a lot of fluid into the lumen so whenever it is secreted you can see diarrhea vibrio cholera always causes diarrhea right was rice water stools and in the middle picture here this is the epithelium and this is the blood vessel and i'm going to emphasize about the pathogens that enters into the cells and cause the localized infections the best example for this is shigella which causes dysentery in humans so here is the shigella organism enters into the gi tract and enters into the epithelial cell so after entering into the epithelial cell it will stay in the epithelial cell and replicates and destroys the neighboring cells only epithelial cell it never enters into the blood stream so whenever it won't enters into the blood stream it it is not it won't disseminate and you can't see any other symptoms in any other parts of the human body only the symptomatic region you can see is gi tract so the third one here we are talking about the systemic spread of the organisms that means the organism enters into the human body enters into the epithelial cell and enters into the blood stream and spread all over the body and you can see the lesions anywhere in the human body the one best example is salmonella typhi you can see the organism enters into the human body and enters into the epithelial cell and afterwards enters into the blood stream and spread all over the body so here so after entering into the human body how this organisms 
are survived from our immune system. So they can be survived in one way by inhibiting phagocytosis. So here is one example of staph areas, how it inhibits phagocytosis by any macrophage or neutrophil. Here is the staph areas organism with its surface molecules called proteinium molecules on its surface. It enters into the body and whenever it enters into the body, immediately the immunoglobulins will come and attaches to the staph areas organisms. That means antibodies. So whenever the antibodies attaches to the staph areas, the staph areas organism immediately secretes its proteinium molecule, which will go and bind to FC portion of the antibody, FC portion. And here you can see one more antibody that will also come and attaches to the staph areas. And staph areas immediately releases this proteinium molecule, which is blocking FC portion. So this FC portion of the antibody is important in occurring phagocytosis. This FC portion always binds to FC receptors in normal situations. But in staph areas organism, the FC portion is blocked by protein A. So whenever it is blocked by protein A, the macrophages searches for immunoglobulins, but it can't bind to immunoglobulins and it can't cause a phagocytosis in this situation. Why? Because it is blocked by protein A here. You can, you can see one more time. It is not phagocytosising the staph areas. So here is one, one more variety of uh, survival of organisms in intracellular pathogens. So some bacterial organisms are entering into the human body. They are taken up by macrophages or neutrophils. They are taken up by phagocytes. Whenever they are taken up by phagocytes, the organisms are engulfed by the macrophages or neutrophils by a phagosome like this. The, these are the red color circles are the bacteria, and this is a phagosome. So if the phagosome is present inside the macrophage, this is the macrophage, the entire blue color one is a macrophage. So whenever they enters into the macrophage <coughs> in a phagocytotic uh, vesicle or a phagosome, some conditions, the lysosomal interaction won't happen. The lysosome tries to mix with phagosome to destroy these pathogens but the lysosomes can't destroy this bacteria. The bacteria inhibits the fusion of uh, lysosome and phagosomal interaction. So these bacteria, after inhibiting, they will comfortably grow replicates inside the phagosome and after replicating, they'll come out of the phagosome and they comfortably live inside the cytoplasm and they will destroy the entire <coughs> macrophage and they'll come out and infect other macrophage or other neutrophils. So in this way they can get survived by inhibiting phagosome and lysosomal interaction. In some other situations <coughs> what happens is the phagosote, phagocyte take this organism by endocytotic vesicle that is phagosome here and the lysosome also fuses with the phagosome even then some bacteria resist this lysosomal activity on the bacteria. They comfortably grow inside the phagosome. Even though the lysosome lysine enzymes acts on it, they can't destroy the bacteria. They comfortably grow inside it. And after growing, they'll come out into the cytoplasm and they'll burst out the macrophage or the neutrophils and they will enter into the system and they will infect the other cells in the human body. In this way, they can survive even though the organisms are phagocytosis. So how this intracellular bacteria can be inhibited or controlled by our immune system? They can be controlled by cell-mediated immunity, especially through type 4 hypersensitivity, uh, hy hypersensitivity reaction, that is by forming granulomas. So what happens is these intracellular bacteria which are living inside the cells will be controlled by activated macrophages through cell mediated immunity or type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. These activated macrophages surround that infected cells and pour all their enzymes on the infected cell and ultimately that infected cell with that organism will be distracted. So the tissue injury, how the tissues will get distracted? That can happen by three ways by the bacteria. One is by exotoxins which are secreted by the bacteria. Second one is endotoxins which are 
which can cause damage to the tissues and these endotoxins are released whenever the bacteria get lysed when the bacteria get destructed the outer membrane fragments can act as endotoxins and by our own immune system specific immune system can also lead to cause tissue injury in humans so we'll see all these three tissue injury mechanisms first one exotoxins exotoxins are protein in nature they are secreted by bacteria and these exotoxins can have two varieties of uh, activity one is enzymatic activity that means by enzymatically that they can destruct the cell membrane or cell wall and the other variety is a and b toxin variety and in this a and b toxin variety the b unit is for binding which can help in addition of the toxin to the host cells and the a unit is the lethal one which can exactly performs the tissue injury we can see some of the examples of exotoxins diphtheria toxin diphtheria toxin is secreted by the organism called cornibacterium diphtheriae and this diphtheria toxin is an a and b toxin and it causes adb ribosylation of elongation factor 2 if by adb ribosylation of elongation factor ab is ribosylates or along ribosylation is one of the same ribosylation of elongation factor 2 it inhibits protein synthesis so whenever the protein synthesis of a cell got inhibited ultimately the cell death occurs the cell will get destructed and all the cells which are affected by diphtheria toxin will get this will get destructed the entire tissue will get destructed and ultimately leads to pseudo membrane formation cholera toxin next one is cholera toxin which is secreted by vibrio cholera organism this cholera toxin causes diarrhea diarrhea how it can cause diarrhea is yes, by activation of adenylase cyclase it can increase cyclic amps inside the cells inside the ga tract epithelial cells so there will be a loss of ions and water secretion for water loss from the epithelial cell and ultimately leads to diarrhea in cholera infection and there is one more a and b toxin that is tetanus toxin which is secreted by clostridium tetani which can cause tetanus infection in humans this tetanus toxin inhibits two neurotransmitters that is glycine and gaba gamma amino butyric acid from inhibitory neurons they inhibit these two neurotransmitters from inhibitory neurons so whenever they inhibit this neurotransmitters ultimately there will be a over contraction of the skeletal muscle occurs whenever the skeletal muscles are over contracted and it is not getting relaxed we can see spasms in that individual that is called as tetanus infection and other variety of exotoxins which can damage the connective tissue are collagenase hyaluronidase collagenase is secreted by clostridium perfringens hyaluronidase can be secreted by staphylococcus aureus these two enzymes or exotoxins can damage the connective tissues and the exotoxin that damage the cell membranes are protease phospholipases both of this have a detergent like action that means they will increase the permeability of the cells and ultimately there is a loss of fluid from the cells and ultimately the cells will get destructed like a detergent like activity and this phospholipase is especially it is important secretion by clostridium perfringens because of this phospholipase the cells will be destructed and it creates an anaerobic environment by clostridium organisms and ultimately that leads to form gas gangrene so in gas gangrene formation the phospholipase plays a major role so how to suppress the action of exotoxin we can suppress the action of exotoxin by antibodies so whenever a person got in, uh, infected with this exotoxin exotoxins we can give preformed antibody antibodies by giving antibodies preformed antibodies they'll the toxin activity will be neutralized or by vaccination we can suppress the exotoxin exotoxin activity next important tissue injury agent is endotoxin endotoxin is a lipid a material in the outer membrane this lipid a is acts as exotoxin endotoxin and this endotoxin can ultimately leads to endotoxic shock whenever the bacteria gram negative bacteria are destructed the destructed outer membrane portion 
can act as endotoxin and ultimately this endotoxin can distract the blood vessels they can distract the macrophages they can hyper stimulate the macrophages which leads to secrete uh, interleukin 1 tumor necrosis factor and which ultimately leads to suppression of complement activity and uh, loss of uh, fluid uh, from the blood vessels into the tissues and which ultimately leads to endotoxic shock that with hypotension because of loss of fluid from the capillaries increasing the permeability of capillaries leads to loss of fluid and we can see a decreased blood pressure hypertension because of secreting interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor by macrophage activation by endotoxin we can see fever and they can also stimulate coagulation of blood cells so we can see intravascular coagulation and there will be a loss of blood supply to the tissues and ultimately leads to organ failure and death which is highly fatal highly fatal conditions we can see by endotoxic shock so here you can see animation of endotoxin function and interleukin-1 also help to stimulate phagocytosis, complement activation, and antibody production by B lymphocytes. When endotoxin is released in large amounts or within the bloodstream, it can have more serious and even deadly effects. Massive amounts of cytokines, particularly interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor, cause loss of fluid from capillaries and vasodilation, both of which cause a lowering of blood pressure often to dangerous levels leading to shock. These same cytokines also stimulate blood coagulation, which makes the shock even more severe. This deadly situation most often occurs in bacterial sepsis caused by E. coli or meningococci in the bloodstream or spinal fluid. So, the tissue injury by specific immunity. So normally, the bacteria which enters into the human body, virulent bacteria, they always secrete a lot of antigens. These antigens ultimately stimulate humoral immunity and cell mediated immunity. Whenever this humoral immunity and cell mediated immunity got activated, there will be a lot of immune response that occurs against that organism and against that antigens. So one immune response that occurs we can call it as type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So the best example for this type 2 hypersensitivity reaction is rheumatic fever caused by streptococcus pyogenes. In this rheumatic fever, the M protein of streptococcus pyogenes cross react with myosins. And because of this cross reaction, the myosin of cardiac muscles will be easily recognized by our own anti uh, our own antibodies whenever our own antibodies cross reacts with the myosin this myosin got damaged and we can see carditis condition and that carditis condition is mainly because of type 2 hypersensitivity reaction that means our own antibodies are cross reacting with our own self antigen that is myosin in rheumatic fever condition so there will be a damage of myosin by our own antibodies by our own immune system so that is we'll call it as type 2 hypersensitivity reaction which ultimately leads to autoimmune condition there and third one is and the second one is type 3 hypersensitivity reaction you can see this hype type 3 hypersensitivity reaction in uh, streptococcus pyogenes glomerular nephritis in this glomerular nephritis the antibodies which are produced against this antigens cross reacts and that complexes antigen and antibody complexes are deposited on the basement membrane whenever they are deposited on the basement membrane of glomerulus we can see the glomerular nephritis 
that is a type 3 hypersensitive reaction because of our own immune activity the glomerular nephritis occurs in that situation the tissue damage occurring in that situation and the third one is type 4 hypersensitive reaction especially you can see one good example for type 4 hypersensitivity in tubercular infection so whenever tubercular organisms are intracellular pathogens so these intracellular pathogens are controlled by cell mediated immunity that means the activated macrophage surrounds that infected cells of the host and they will try to destroy that infected cells during that form of destruction all these activated macrophages are, are organized in the form of small bolus and this small bolus we can call it as granuloma if these granulomas entering into the blood, blood vessels they will destroy the endothelial cell and which can ultimately leads to necrosis of the tissues and these granulomas can also destruct the neighboring host tissue cells which can cause a tissue injury so because of our own immune system we can see the tissue injury by three ways type 2 hypersensitive reaction type 3 type 4 in some conditions not always in some conditions